Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Spar and Brawl. I hope you're having a decent day. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Sam. But today, we also have the pleasure of being joined by Professor Joel Whitebook. So, Professor, thank you again for joining us. So this interview is part of our Frankfurt School series. So if you just stumbled on the interview itself, you can find links in the description to other interviews we've done as well as the series. So with that out of the way, please like and subscribe. And I'm just going to read a quick introduction, overview of Joel, and then we'll get right into it. Joel Whitebook is a philosopher and psychoanalyst. He attended the University of California at Berkeley in the late 60s, where he majored in philosophy. While he was a student and activist at Berkeley, Joel discovered the tradition of the Frankfurt School. After receiving his PhD in philosophy, Joel decided to become a practicing psychoanalyst. To this end, he took a second doctorate in clinical psychology at CUNY and received his psychoanalytic training at the New York Freudian Society. Joel also studied with Albert Vellmer, who was one of the most important members of the second generation of the Frankfurt School when he was a graduate student in the New School for Social Research. In his book, Perversion and Utopia, and in numerous articles as well, Joel has sought to continue the Frankfurt School's attempt to integrate psychoanalysis and critical theory. Following the lead of Hans Lowald and Cornelius Castoriadis, he has examined the major developments in psychoanalysis since the middle of the last century and attempted to work out their consequences for contemporary psychoanalysis and critical theory. He is also the author of many, many books, including a biographical one on Freud called Freud, an Intellectual Biography. Joel, and thank you again for joining us. If there's something perhaps you want to add, and you've also done work on Sopranos, of course, that we hope to get to towards the end. Well, that was perfectly comprehensive. <laughs> Perfect. Thank okay. You. So let us, let's get us started. I'll go through some of the first few questions and then Sam will take over halfway through. So as I mentioned, we've already done a few interviews a lot on the Frankfurt School and so we don't want to go everything from the beginning. So it might seem like we're kind of parachuting in the middle of the story, but hopefully it all makes sense. So can you just please tell us a little bit about the evolving relationship between psychoanalysis and critical theory? Evolving from, from the beginning or in recent years? Um, as you we'll can start from, start from the beginning. Yes, because yeah. I was going to say with the others, we don't touch too much on Freud and psychoanalysis. So with this question, please feel free to start from the beginning. Well, when Leo Lowenthal, who was one of the major figures of the first generation, uh, wrote to Horkheimer and asked him what the role of psychoanalysis was in critical theory, Horkheimer wrote back and said, it's essential, it's one of our building blocks. So I would argue that along with Hegel, Marx, and Max Weber, Freud, in fact, represents one of the foundation stones or building blocks of critical theory. Uh, while the critical theorists of the first generation were Marxists, they were Marxists of a very heterodox sort. And that heterodoxy, you might say, uh, is what led them to Freud uh, for a theoretical reason and for a practical reason. Uh, theoretically, uh, they were opposed to the sort of objectivism or reductionism of uh, orthodox Marxism, which reduced superstructure to base, consciousness to economic factors, and so on and so forth. Uh, which is to say they were bothered what is often referred to as the lack of, a, of the subjective dimension, the anti-psychologism of orthodox uh, Freudian uh, Marxism. So one reason they turned to psychoanalysis was to correct that fact. I should go back, uh, uh, another historical point. Uh, the Frankfurt School uh, was the first uh, group of university uh, philosophers and social scientists to take Freud seriously. Uh, which was quite a uh, radical thing to do at the time uh, in a uh, German university, given the conservatives of a German university, uh, given the fact how scandalous Freud was and that he was a Jew. And the relationship between uh, the analyst and Frank, the uh, critical theorist in Frankfurt and the analyst was quite intimate. They actually shared the same building they shared the same classrooms. 
Uh, they co-sponsored talks where they brought in some of the most eminent psychoanalysts of the day, uh, Anna Freud, for example. Uh, and uh, Max, Heim, uh, Max Horkheimer sat on the board of directors of both the Institute for Social Research and the Frankfurt Psychoanalytic Institute. And another figure who uh, bridged both schools uh, was Eric Fromm, who was a trained psychoanalyst and also a critical theorist. And in fact, it was he who educated the other members of the Institute about psychoanalysis. So that aside, let me get back to my narrative. Uh, so the, theoret uh, the theoretical motive uh, for uh, incorporating psychoanalysis into critical theory was, as I said, the lack of a subjective dimension in orthodox Marxism. But then uh, certain political and historical factors entered in, uh, which uh, led them to take up psychoanalysis in their research. Uh, the major one uh, was the fact that during the 30s, uh, during a period of economic crisis, which Marxism would have predicted would have produced a socialist revolution or the radicalization of the proletariat, the proletariat in fact turned in the opposite direction and became conservative and fascist. So they wanted to use psychoanalysis to understand why this happened. Uh, and the result of that project, of that, that undertaking, uh, was a, uh, was a um, study called uh, Authority in the Family, uh, which was one of the, perhaps the first uh, research project which took up psychoanalysis to try and understand uh, uh, political, economic and political phenomenon like that. Uh, at the time, they were using a relatively conventional concept of psychoanalysis and uh, explain the uh, reactions of the German working class uh, in terms of uh, ego structure, obsessive compulsiveness, uh, and so on and so forth. Later on, they'll take up a more radicalized version of it. Uh, so then when they were in exile in the States, in fact, when uh, Harkheimer and Adorno uh, were in Los Angeles, uh, two things happened. Uh, they got news, they received news that the Nazis were putting the final solution into launching it, pursuing it, it had begun. And at the same time, they received news that their friend and colleague, Walter Benjamin, had committed suicide trying to escape the Gestapo. And this led to an enormous emotional and theoretical crisis uh, on their part. Uh, which led them to the conclusion that they had to radicalize their position. I know Martin Jay probably talked about this with you. So whereas before they were still pursuing something like the uh, critique of political economy, although in a very heterogeneous and sophisticated war, they realized that they had to radicalize their critique and they took up the domination of nature as the central theme of the dialectic of enlightenment. And part uh, of the, uh, I should put, uh, one major dimension of the dialectic of enlightenment was the Freudian dimension. And their basic thesis in the dialectic of enlightenment was that the domination of external nature and the domination of internal nature mutually entail one another. And in order to dominate the external world, human beings had to turn themselves into what they say, purposive reified agents. So that's where Freud came in. But now it wasn't the Freud, the more conventional Freud. It was the more controversial Freud of the late cultural writings, uh, most importantly, uh, civilization's discontents. I mean, I, I could continue, but I don't know if Oh, no, please, please do continue. Yeah. I mean, I just had one small follow-up question from the beginning. All right, please continue. And that was just, what did you mean by subjectivity when you said uh, Marxism lacked the subjective um, subjective analysis? Well, but then please continue, yes. 
consciousness, psychology uh, were taken to be epiphenomena. Uh, they were taken to be epiphenomena of material conditions. Uh, I mean, the old way of putting it was there was a difference between base and superstructure and super, superstructure meaning culture, consciousness, psychology, these were all epiphenomenal or epiphenomena, which could be reduced to explained away by material factors. I see, yes, no, that's, that's what I thought you meant. Right. Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, please continue. I mean, you know, our next question was going to be, do you, uh, do you see the marriage of Marxism and Freud or critical theory? Sure. Sorry to be worthwhile, but yeah, go ahead, Sam. Uh, no, I just wanted to... Yes. Before, uh, say, just because you were on talking about Adorno and talk about that the next generation of psychiatrists, they have a different idea about how uh, self and ego is formed. Does that like critical theorists, do they acknowledge that? Do they like the next generation of critical theorists like Habermas or uh, other ones, they sort of try to integrate the new uh, new uh, ideas within like Freudian psychoanalysis? I, actually, that's where I'm heading towards in my narrative. But I have oh, to sorry. One, one step before that. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the dialectic of enlightenment uh, led to a, I, I dislike the word, but for lack of a better word, uh, to a very uh, pessimistic, uh, evaluation of the historical and political situation. It led to the thesis of what they called a totally administered world. And then Marcuse, who was one of their colleagues, uh, took the thesis of a totally administered world or the dialectic of enlightenment and concretized it in his book, uh, or, uh, One Dimensional Man, which was sort of an, empir an empirical concretization of this more abstract argument pessimistic argument uh, about, uh, uh, which was referred to as a totally administered world. Uh, and this was a, re I mean, both the thesis of the totally administered world and the thesis of the dialectic of enlightenment uh, reflected the fact that the members of the first generation uh, concluded uh, that after the second world war, uh, when one could no longer assume that the proletariat was an agent of social revolution, when in fact the working class was being co-opted and incorporated into the welfare state, uh, they saw the possibility of a radical transformation of society as being practically nil. But the interesting thing is, Marcuse wrote One Dimensional Man in the 60s, right before all hell was about to break loose with the new left and the Cultural Revolution. But the other interesting thing is, uh, in the 50s, in the height of the McCarthy era, in the height of the social conservatism of the states, in the height of the Adenauer era in Germany, he wrote Eros and Civilization. Mm -hmm. And in Eros and Civilization, he tried to show, as he said, to, it was a purely philosophical argument, purely theoretical argument. He wasn't making any empirical claims, but he wanted to show that the idea of a non-repressive society, which is the Freudian name for utopia, is possible and that it could be uh, demonstrated through an imminent critique of Freud himself. In a way, he wanted to stand for it on his head and take the arguments of a deeply pessimistic book like Civilization and Discontents and read them in such a way that they showed the, that, at least theoretically, a non repressive or utopian uh, um, uh, society was possible. Now, Hawka Adorno was very skeptical about this sort of utopianism. They were, uh, Hawka and Adorno were unwilling to go that route. Marcuse in the 50s posited as a theoretical possibility. And then when the uh, 
new left broke out in the late 60s in the counterculture, he claimed, he argued that what he had demonstrated was a theoretical possibility in the 50s was now being enacted and realized, at least the rudiments of it were being enacted and realized uh, by the radical movements of the 60s. And he became a very enthusiastic supporter of uh, the new left and the cultural Revo revolution, although he had his reservations. And in this, he was very, uh, uh, took a very different path uh, than Adorno. And in fact, there's a series of letters between them, which you can see in the, uh, uh, they're published in the New Left Review about the 60s, where, uh, I mean, I think Adorno and the others kind of think that Marcuse had lost it and flipped out and became too enthusiastic. <laughs> so then with the, with the end of the New Left, and with the decline of the movements in the 60s, uh, Marcuse sort of faded into the past. And as the world became more conservative, as the, uh, the 68 spirit seemed to be, uh, uh, how should I put it? Seemed to have been a myth. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the point in which Habermas appeared on the scene, who became the leader of the second generation. Now Habermas's approach and sensibility was much different than the first generation. Uh, I should say that the first generation, and especially Marcuse, uh, were quite suspicious of German social democracy. They had all come of age at the time of the First World War when the, uh, the uh, SPD, uh, rather than opposing the First World War, uh, rather than joining up with the international proletariat, voted for war credits. And then the SPD was also complicitous in the uh, murder of uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Carl Wittenberg. And for Mar Marcuse especially, that was a decisive experience. Uh, but not just he, but I would say all of them were colored by that experience with the SPD. And while they refused to embrace, with the exception of Marcuse, a revolutionary position, they were, they were also skeptical of, uh, of uh, social democracy. Habermas's sensibility was very different. First of all, his biography was different. The older members were practically all Jewish. Uh, most of them had to leave the country. So the Holocaust, Auschwitz, exile formed their, their, their sensibility. Habermas came of age during the Nazi period and witnessed it. And uh, when it ended, uh, he, he uh, I would say at the center of his uh, concern uh, was the formation of a, uh, a uh, democratic society in the Federal Republic in West Germany. And that had consequences for his theory. Uh, he considered himself a radical liberal, a radical reformist. And uh, he uh, rejected the idea of revolution and he both advocated uh, radical reform and thought that it was possible. And the premise of that was that the destructive sides of capitalism could be contained. So he developed an, a much different theory. Uh, he had a much different sensibility. He had much different priorities and he developed a much different theory. And also he, uh, he thought that the old German philosophy uh, of uh, the great figures like Heidegger uh, were somehow tied up with uh, the Nazi past. So he wanted to turn to uh, analytic philosophy, other philosophical traditions, and sort of bring German philosophy into the, uh, into the uh, contemporary world. Uh, so in the beginning, in Knowledge and Human Interests, uh, it's still a transitional book. So he's got his one foot in the camp of the old Frankfurt School, and the other he's moving towards the, his communication theory and his linguistic philosophy. So while he, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very important, he 
last three chapters are a very important study of Freud, uh, you can already see in them uh, the roots, the roots that will cause him to move away from Freud. The most important one being that he argues that the unconscious is linguistic. For Freud, the main difference between consciousness and the unconscious was between a non-linguistic domain and a linguistic domain, which means, means the self was essentially split. It was a conflictual theory. Habermas, and he was motivated to do this partly by his interest in uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, philosophy of language, which was current at the time, uh, argued that the uh, um, unconscious was already linguistic or proto-linguistic. So while he engaged Freud in knowledge and human interests, the seeds for his moving away from Freud were already there. And it wasn't too long after that that he gave up Freud and he moved to the cognitive theories of uh, uh, Lawrence Kohlberg and Jean Piaget. So my, uh, one of my oh, ongoing themes has been to criticize what I consider Habermas's domestication of psychoanalysis or flight from psychoanalysis, which I think is tied up with some of the political and philosophical uh, problems with his position. And I, I won't go into, and I would say this, I'd say the same thing applies uh, mutatis mutandis to the work of Axel Hohn. See, so, uh... I think in the beginning or at some point you mentioned how the first generation of the Frankfurt School were really perhaps the last or one of the only scholars who really mix political science, sociology with psychoanalysis. So if you had to kind of sell to someone the, the value of including psychoanalysis when looking at, of course, macro or like let's call it political issues, what would you say to someone like that who would be perhaps slightly skeptical in whether... For instance, I mean, I know I've read just very, very little, but sometimes when I uh, read uh, Arrows and Civilization, which is the first book I read with Marcus, sometimes I think that perhaps without Freud and psychoanalysis, he could still be making um, a lot of his points. Although, of course, I see that they come from there. So what would you say from some, to someone who makes such a layman kind of criticism slash question? Uh I would say Freud's discovery of the unconscious was a watershed. Uh, you know, uh, Jan Oswin talked about, about the mosaic divide. I would say it was a Freudian divide. And that discovery of the unconscious created a divide in not just philosophy and social theory and so on, uh, which we can't go back behind. And that to understand so many of the phenomena of the contemporary world, uh, you require a concept of the unconscious. I mean, today, where we're witnessing such irrationality with QAnon, with the anti-vaxxers, uh, with the Trumpers, uh, you can't explain this with a theory that doesn't have a theory of, the uh, of, uh, of irrationality. I mean, human beings, political actors, are not just rational agents. And unless you have a robust theory of irrationality, I would say psychoanalysis, not just Freud, but psychoanalysis over the last 150 years provides us with the best uh, theory for grasping irrationality. You can't get at what's going on. Uh, so going Go back to, do you want to do a follow-up or? No, no, I was just kind of thinking it through so you can maybe go ahead while I no, no, no. So, uh, going back to your like criticism of Habermas, do you disagree with him on the linguistic aspect of the unconscious, or do you disagree with him on like the uh, on how like how uh, how uh, I guess cooperative the nature of communication between unconscious and conscious is? Like, wh where does your disagreement lie, basically, on the? whole idea that unconscious can talk or how it talks, I guess. Uh, first of all, I have general disagreements with this whole communication theory in the linguistic term. And I think that 
uh, the uh, misunderstanding, the misconstrual of psychoanalysis is a consequence of the linguistic turn. And the impulse of communication theory or the linguistic turn is there's a linguistifying thrust in it. Everything has to be explained in terms of language, in terms of, of, of the linguistic, uh, which means he was compelled to try and explain the unconscious in terms of the linguistic. Um, so, I mean, the major question, or a major question for psychoanalytic theory is how does the unconscious become conscious? And Freud argued uh, that, uh, as I said, the distinguishing feature between the unconscious and consciousness is the unconscious is non-linguistic. He said it's, it contains thing representations, pictorial, and that consciousness is linguistically me mediated. And that the way to, the way that unconscious mentations become conscious is to have what he said, word representations added to thing representations. They have to become linguistified. But the linguistic and the non-linguistic are heterogeneous. It's, I mean, you can't easily translate one, one of the, the unconscious is not easily translatable into consciousness. As Freud said, it requires a special effort. Uh, you have to have uh, uh, certain techniques to get around the defenses which uh, mitigate against it becoming conscious. And when you say that the uh, unconscious is already linguistic, you really remove the element of struggle. You really remove the conflict. You really remove the difficulty, which I would say is the defining feature of psychoanalysis. You no longer have a conflicted subject. The human being is no longer a split subject uh, because there's not a split between the linguistic and the prelinguistic. So it, it pacifies Freud. It makes it too easy. It makes it too rational. But let me say on the other side that I think the idea of health, which you not only find in uh, Habermas, but you find in Castoriadis, you find in Lowell, who's an American or German-American psychoanalysis, who I draw on extensively, is that health uh, consists in, and it's actually there in Freud, uh, developing the right kind of communication between the advanced parts of the psyche and the archaic, uh, between the rational parts and the, uh, and the irrational parts. I mean, the sort of overly rational conception of psychoanalysis is that progress and maturity consists in the ego and consciousness coming to dominate the id and the unconscious. That the advance comes to uh, dominate the archaic or the primitive. That's sort of a model that we want to reject, I want to reject, and replace it with a uh, model where uh, health, if you want to use that term, or a propitious form of psychic integration consists in the right form of communication between our more primitive and archaic selves and our more advanced and rational selves. It's not that the rational gets rid of the irrational, it's that you create a new synthesis between the two. Sorry, Professor Joel, I'm sorry for kind of jumping back and forth here, but I just want to um, go back to your response. And I just want to ask you, so for instance, if we take um, QAnon, how would you, you know, how would you use subconscious and psychoanalysis to kind of explain why people are attracted towards that kind of conspiracy theory? Oh, I mean, uh, I think about it a lot. I haven't come up with a good enough explanation to write about. Uh, so I'm not going to offer any sort oh, of... Uh, that's okay. Perhaps uh, just with another kind of example, whichever were. Well, you know, uh, in Adorno's, uh, in, in Minimum Moralia, uh, there's a section called Theses on the Occult. 
and he talks about why people start turning to, he has another piece that he calls the stars down to earth, why people turn to astrology. And his argument is that when they become helpless in their social situation, when they're overwhelmed by their social situation, uh, they overcome this helplessness by trying to come up with these occult explanation for what's going on. Uh, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a fight from the helplessness of social reality. So I, I saw, you know, along those lines, you could say, when, when the world is becoming more overwhelming, we're feeling more helpless. You know, in the States we've had, uh, you know, years of traumatic experiences, the experience of the war in Vietnam, the Iraq experience, 9-11, um, the stock market crash, COVID, so on and so forth. I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, that social reality uh, is overwhelming and feels like it's completely out of control. So uh, a reaction to that experience is to come up with these conspiracy theories uh, that explain what's really going on. Conspiracy, I mean, you know, Freud described paranoid theories as airtight, totalizing explanations that can't be refuted. So if you're feeling helpless and, and uh, you're feeling totally at sea, uh, a comprehensive, airtight, uh, non-falsifiable mm -hmm. theory uh, can serve as a defensive escape from the helplessness. It would be something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think if I understood you correctly, I mean, just kind of made me think sometimes when people have these conspiracy theories, they do try to explain everything together in one go. And they're, they're rarely content with perhaps just having a conspiracy that touches on one point, but they kind of want to have this global explanation. I think if I was understanding the last part of your answer correctly. Well, that's perfectly right. They're totalizing. Mm, they can't, totalizing, yeah. Can't, can't tolerate anything outside of them. So they mm -hmm. have to have to assimilate everything to this, this, this I mean so we you know I we get all these crazy phenomena here in American politics phenomena yes okay so I think unless Sam you had a follow-up question I guess so otherwise we can go back so did Habermas kind of spell the end of the critical theory and um, Freudian mix in my opinion yes mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, there are pe different people have different interpretations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would say there's a radical break between the first generation and the second. And Habermas at times has, has said so himself. And while there's, there's a continuity of certain themes, modernity, rationality, and so on and so forth, the way Habermas treats them is extremely different from mm -hmm. the way the first generation treated them. Uh, and in terms of their being, uh, as I said, while, while they weren't revolutionaries, they weren't social democrats either, whereas Habermas is a self-proclaimed uh, social democrat. Uh, let me say one other thing. Please. One of the things that attracted me to psychoanalysis, as you mentioned, I mean, I, I read Marcuse when I was a, a philosophy student at Berkeley, and also very involved in the, uh, in the New Left and the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. And uh, two things that attracted me to uh, critical theory, uh, and this is also the late 60s when the ecology movement was first bursting on the, on the scene. And I was very active in the early ecology movement and it sort of caught my imagination. Uh, so one of the reasons I was attracted to the Frankfurt School was that the domination of nature uh, mm -hmm. was so central to their uh, to the thinking of the first generation. The other thing that I became interested in was psychoanalysis, also partly through Marcuse and Eros and Civilization. So the two themes that really attracted me to critical theory, namely uh, domination of nature, and psychoanalysis have more or less dropped out of the Habermasian approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are, there are systematic reasons, structural reasons in his philosophy why he can't address the domination of nature. 
And I think it's sort of a scandal now that maybe the biggest political crisis facing the species, I mean, the world's either burning up or underwater, is the uh, is, uh, ecological crisis or, or uh, climate crisis. When, and critical theory, which is supposed to confront the most important political problems of the day, doesn't have anything to say about it. Can't mm-hmm. say anything about it. Neither Habermas's theory nor, Horn- nor Honus. Mm-hmm. You see, that was actually going to be my question because you start off as a philosopher and then move towards psychoanalysis. So you answered that. And it's actually very interesting. Our previous interview, uh, Professor Leslie, she didn't come from a psychoanalysis background, but for her also, Frankfurt School was just really the first generation. Um, so I wanted to ask you perhaps to... Well, um, you know, there seems to be, I don't know if you're mm-hmm. counting this with the people you've been interviewed, there seems to be a rediscovery of Adorno on I mean, for a long time, he was out of fashion, but I am finding with the younger generation, they're going back to him. Yes, I've heard of that. I mean, I was watching a, a podcast that was recorded perhaps uh, a year or two, three years ago with uh, Douglas Kellner. Um, I'm sure you're familiar. And yes, they were they were kind of talking about how on Instagram and there are all these kind of Adorno memes and everything <laughs> reemerging. I haven't seen them myself, but and same so, with sort of Marcuse, uh, I oh. would say, and Benjamin as well. Yes. Like oh, Benjamin. I mean, the first really generation. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Benjamin's been popular for a while uh, because he, the, uh, the literary people have been interested in him. Uh, but Adorno and, uh, uh, or the, uh, the literary Adorno was also popular. Mm-hmm. But the philosophical and political Adorno and the philosophical oh, and nice. political Marcuse have sort of been out of fashion. Eclipsed by Habermas. I see. Yes, I kind of learned about Adorno through kind of this series of bit. When I took a political philosophy class in university, the teacher did a really nice job of she went for she did first a little bit of Marx, then Freud, uh, civilization and discontent, and then moved on to arrows and civilization, which was really a nice way of explaining it. So I kind of had one question on Freud specifically, which is that what would you make of accusations of his work perhaps um, lacking scientific basis? What would you make of that? And then I believe you elaborate a few of your own critiques on Freud, but if you want to add a few, um, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, like what do you say to critics that they say there must be a cognitive basis or biological basis for all the all the explanations of mind's activities. So that's the biggest, I guess, criticism of Freud. And yeah, after that, if you could just say uh, what was, because I just started reading your biography of Freud and uh, yeah, you have your own criticisms, but I haven't really read it properly to be able to say anything. So I thought maybe you could put them in a nice little thing for Uh, us. Look, Freud was a physician. Freud started out as a neurologist. Freud cut up thousands of brains. Uh, Freud in no way denied that the psyche or consciousness had a material base. I mean, he was not an idealist. He was a materialist. The question is, what's the relationship, as they put it today, between brain and mind? And, you know, with the, uh, with the uh, fashionableness of uh, neuropsych, uh, there is everybody has a rather ambitious program or I want to say everybody, there's a tendency which has an ambitious program that mind is going to eventually be uh, reduced to brain. I mean, with the, with the, with the discovery of the brain imaging tech, uh, equipment, uh, the uh, neuropsychologists have become very, very ambitious. They say that the neuro, that the imaging equipment uh, is to them as the telescope was to Galileo. And they're finally going to be able to solve all the questions about uh, my, uh, uh, the brain and maybe mind and brain, which I think at this stage is a very, very premature claim and overly ambitious. Uh, as for uh, the scientific status of psychoanalysis, uh, I mean, one thing that we have to give Habermas credit for, and we also have to give Paul Ricoeur credit for, who wrote his Freud and philosophy at the same time as Habermas wrote uh, Knowledge and Human Interest, 
is that they both provided very, very sophisticated uh, critiques of the positivist critique of psychoanalysis. And rather than taking uh, the positivist model as uh, prescriptive in saying that the human sciences should model themselves on the natural sciences, they thought that psychoanalysis, if you understood psychoanalysis properly, it could be used to criticize a positivist conception of the human sciences. So the, the, the arguments which we've been hearing for since the, since the beginning, mm -hmm. that psychoanalysis isn't scientific, is based on the old positivist model of science, which I would argue has been discredited. And I would also argue, as I just said, that uh, following Habermas and Ricoeur, uh, that not psychoanalysis as it un was understood by Freud, uh, but uh, if we look to what Freud did rather than what he said, we can start to formulate a critique of, uh, of uh, positivist conception of science. So, you know, okay. Habermas, Habermas referred to uh, Freud's scientific self misunderstanding. <laughs> And his, I mean, it's a typically Habermasian formulation. Uh, and, uh, but Habermas tried to show how Freud's own scientific misunderstanding was in fact a misunderstanding and that there's a much more uh, acceptable interpretation of psychoanalysis, which not only avoids the criticisms of the positivists, but in fact, turns the table on the positivists. Mm. Oh. Very interesting. Yeah, I, 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 an enormously important book for me along the way is Paul Ricoeur's Freud and Philosophy, which I take it isn't read very much anymore. But I think it's one of the most crucial books in this whole discussion. Okay, see, no, I haven't heard or read it about sure. either. So thank you for that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. No, actually, yeah, be, like, yeah, I mean, before, I was going to segue to my questions about hermeneutics of suspicions which is Paul Ricoeur's thing. But uh, before that, I thought maybe you want to tell, tell us about your criticism of Freud or how Freud should be evolved, like uh, how should be, be used these days? First of all, I mean, the criticisms of Freud by the feminists, by the gay community, uh, by political progressive, a lot of them are well-founded. Uh, Freud said some very awful and embarrassing things about women in particular. Uh, his treatment of uh, the Emma Eckstein case is a scandal, uh, you know, something all the feminists point to. So I don't want to deny any of those social and political criticisms. Uh, if you, you said you're beginning to read my Freud biography. I mean, my strategy there is, uh, I take a distinction that Hans Lowald makes between the official Freud and the unofficial Freud and sort of use the unofficial Freud to criticize the official Freud. And Freud, the official Freud was the Freud of the Oedipus complex and which occurs in the third, fourth, fifth years of life. And he really, and he admitted this, that he really uh, wasn't very good at understanding pre oedipal experience and understanding the, uh, what, what happens in the first three years of life. And uh, one of my main arguments in the biography is to try and explain why he couldn't uh, really take up, enter into and take up early experience. And so against him, uh, I find the work of Winnicott, the uh, English analyst D.W. Winnicott, very useful. And Winnicott says his position is not to reject Freud, but to complete his work. And he said, Freud's theory begins at say the age of three, when a unit self has been formed, uh, when there is a, uh, a self with a distinction between the inside and the outside, when a uh, 
differentiated unit self can interact with other unit selves. When the unit self has a structure, a superego, an ego, and a, so Freud's theory applies after the unit self has been formed. What Winnicott wants, what Winnicott provides is a theory of the genesis of the unit self. What happens between ages uh, zero and three uh, so that uh, separation individuation process takes place, uh, a unit self is formed. And whereas for Freud, the role of the Oedipal father is central, for Winnicott, uh, the role of the early mother is central. And probably the most important thing that's happened after Freud's death, and I go into this in detail in my book, is what's called the pre edible turn, where Winnicott is one of the prime representatives, which is to say analysts have become very interested in uh, the early infant-mother relationship, uh, the development of the self, and uh, the, all those sorts of things. Uh, so my, what my, my project has sort of been to take everything that has resulted from the pre edible turn and to use it not just to reevaluate uh, uh, psychoanalytic theory, but to reevaluate the way the Frankfurt School appropriated for it. Oh, sorry, Sam, I thought you, you, you can continue from here because sure. these yeah. next few questions, sure, can I? I can't even, <laughs> I know so little that I can't even read the questions. No, cool. <laughs> uh, so uh, just because we've been talking about it and you mentioned Paul Ricord, uh, I mean, he's a famous philosopher who's famous for his uh, philosophy of uh, hermeneutics of suspicions. And you have a great article, which I read, which is about how hermeneutic of suspicions became less and less uh, sort of relevant and they became sort of sidelined by the linguistic turn and all that. But before that, I just wondered, because this is something I never, like how does Paul Ricord differ from Frankfurt School? Because he's also combining Freud and Marx and Nietzsche, but you know, he seems to be in a very similar sort of, he seems to be involved in a very similar project, but they are, they are never put together. They are completely. Well, that's not true. Things. That's not true. Actually one, one of, uh, I mean, uh, you know, both Ricoeur and Habermas did, their, did much of their major work in the middle of the last century when the linguistic turn was dominant, not just in philosophy, but in, in uh, social sciences and, I mean, land and linguistics. Uh, and uh, the analysis of knowledge and human interests and of foreign philosophy is very close. And... Uh, uh, there was actually an early debate between Gadamer and Habermas, uh, which is extremely important. In fact, I would say it's one of the most important debates in post-war philosophy. And Ricoeur actually wrote a paper discussing it, which I think is really quite brilliant. Uh, the Herman, I mean, he talks about the, 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 uh, the masters of suspicion, Freud, Marx, and Nietzsche. That's that's what. And the hermeneutics of suspicion is a different name for what the Marxists called the critique of ideology, which was the model that informed the early Frankfurt School and informed the early Habermas. I mean, we can say when Habermas moved away from the first generation, he dropped the critique of ideology or the hermeneutics of suspicion and move to his communication theory. And I mean, it's too technical to go into here, but the question then becomes, what if you don't take the critique of ideology or the hermeneutics of suspicion as your model for critique, what does critique mean given a communication theory? How is critique possible given a communication theory? I mean, this is, this is one aspect of Habermas's de-radicalization of the, of the project. So the idea is, I leave Nietzsche out because he's a bit different, but with Freud and Marx, uh, they can both be interpreted as offering theories of false consciousness. Uh, I mean, for Marx, 
It's the, I mean, it's ideology critique. False consciousness is the, the uh, false consciousness of the proletariat. They don't realize their true class interests. Uh, for Freud, false, uh, Habermas interprets neurosis as, as false consciousness. It's a uh, systematically falsified uh, understanding, misunderstanding of oneself. So in both cases, you have a uh, form of false consciousness as the phenomenon to be explained and to be gotten rid of. It's not just an intellectual critique. It's an emancipatory critique. With, uh, with Marx, is supposed to lead to revolutionary consciousness. And for Freud, uh, it's supposed to lead to some sort of emancipated psychological consciousness. So the question is, your suspicion is you take the given consciousness, the consciousness of the proletariat or the consciousness of the patient. You take it as a starting point, but you don't accept it as is. You're suspicious about it. You don't take its own truth claim. And then you have, then the next step is to explain how that false consciousness arose. So for Marx, you have an economic explanation of how the economic base produces false consciousness in the superstructure. And for Freud, you have a psychosexual explanation that explains how the false conscious, uh, how the one psychosexual history and experience produces neurotic symptoms. And then the idea is once you understand the genesis of those states of false consciousness, then you can criticize them and dissolve them and create a true state of consciousness. Uh, you know, again, for Marx, it's the class consciousness of the proletariat. For Freud, it's the, I mean, the non-pathological consciousness of the, uh, of the patient, the former patient. Uh, okay, no, just, is there any, like, what is, what is the, like, the debate within Godheimer and Habermas, what did, do they disagree on theoretical concepts, or do they disagree on, uh, like, conclusions? Which uh, precisely on this I, point, Godheimer has a thesis called, do you, uh, the, uh, I think it's the universality of hermeneutics. Godheimer says, wow. all our access to the world and all our access to everything is through language. And the only way we have access to it and uh, the only way we can apprehend it and grapple with it is through language. Habermas says, yes, that's true, but there are forces that act on language and distort it. Power, uh, for example. So the deliverances of language, so to speak, can't be taken at face value because they're distorted by external forces, power, class interests, uh, psychosexual factors, and so on and so forth. So whereas Gadamer is advocating a pure hermeneutics or the universality of hermeneutics, Habermas is advocating a hermeneutics of suspicion or a critical hermeneutics. That is to say, we take the deliverances of language, uh, we don't take the deliverances of language as being ultimate, we try and explain how they become distorted. But there's one more turn to the argument. And Gadamer says to Habermas, well, that's true, Jürgen. I don't deny that there's a place for the critique of ideology, the critique of false consciousness, but it too has to take place within language. Therefore, hermeneutics trumps the um, critique of ideology. And in my opinion, it's a, it's a very profound debate and there's no, nobody delivers a knockdown punch and Ricoeur has a wonderful discussion of it. Nice, thank you. Uh, so yeah, just, Continuing on that, do you think hermeneutics is, the, do you think it's a negative development that it's become such a, it's not very popular, nobody, like really compared to critical theory or other trends within Marxism, or it's, it's not as popular as it used to be. Do you think that's a negative development in academia or no? 
look, I, I really don't have a clear picture of what the role of hermeneutics is in the discussions today. I mean, the, you know, uh, Gadamer was a very important figure. Uh, the uh, appropriation of hermeneutics in philosophy and the human sciences was very important. And, uh, you know, I, I, as I say, I don't think it's the ultimate position, but I think it was a very important contribution. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't comment on its contemporary status. Sure. And uh, we had one question, which was a bit more like, again, it's just about contemporary today. Do, do you, what you, you had one article about Jung, but I couldn't find it to read it or anything. But there, about Jung? Jung was mentioned in the title. No, no, you wrote an article about Freud, Fleece, and Jung, I think, was the title. Oh, well, you'll see two chapters in my book are about the Is, about Freud and Jung. And, oh, I see. I haven't gotten there. Uh, I think that um, you might say, I mean, that this is a common description. This is what I argue in the book. Jung recommend, uh, represented the counter-enlightenment in psychoanalysis. I mean, if Freud is an enlightenment figure, then Jung uh, 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 represented the counter-enlightenment. You might say Jung's role in psychoanalysis is analogous to Heidegger's role in philosophy, that they both rep are reactionaries who represent the counter enlightenment. And, uh, you know, uh, Jung really wanted to counter uh, Freud's, uh, and, but Freud wasn't a pure enlightenment figure. Uh, he, I mean, I can't go into it here, but if you look at the book, you'll see, I, I say he's not a 18th century enlightenment figure like Kant, he might be a representative of what you call the dark enlightenment. So the uh, the attempt to uh, uh, the attempt to construe him as sort of a overly rationalistic Kantian doesn't make sense. Uh, Freud's encounter with Jung was very very important for Freud's development. Uh, he pushed Freud uh, to take up early experience more, to take up the irrational, to take up the occult to go in directions Freud wasn't inclined to go. Uh, Jung started out as a um, psychiatrist at uh, Berg Hertzli Hospital in, uh, in uh, Zurich. And he had extensive experience working with, with psychotic patients, which Freud didn't. And therefore uh, he had a much more experience dealing with uh, primitive um, psychological phenomena, which Freud didn't. And while ultimately I am very critical of Jung, uh, he served an important role in pushing Freud to take up certain questions, uh, which he was uh, reluctant to take up, sort of to push him out of his comfort zone, you might say. And uh, one of Freud's most important articles, uh, namely on narcissism, which he wrote after the break with Jung, uh, never would have happened without the encounter with him. Well, I'm, suspicious. You... I'm suspicious of Jung's, uh, I mean, he was very reactionary politically. Uh, he was an anti-Semite, uh, you know, he... Uh, uh, I, I, Astrology. I, I, well, the occult, I mean, Freud said to him, he said, uh, you know, don't get swept away by the black mud of the occult. Jung even <laughs> said, he said, where Freud's idea was the enlightenment, he said, my world is the world of knights and princes and the Holy Grail. He, he like Heidegger, he was an anti-modernist and he sort of wanted to re-enchant the world. Explicitly, I mean, that was his problem. Well, how come... How come do you think him and his like the people who sort of have the similar Jungian style are still so popular to this day compared to Freudians in terms of just the books they sell or among the popular people, not academia? It's not just that, you know, I had a very interesting experience. I was at MIT for a conference once. And I had some time to kill, so I wandered into the bookstore. Mm -hmm. The whole psychology section was Jung. Oh, wow. So in this hyper-rational <laughs> scientific, uh, scientific institution, the psychology they were reading was Jung. So scientism and irrationalism 
aren't necessarily opposed. <laughs> uh, are you, if, you go to, if you go to California and you go into a bookstore in Santa Cruz, for example, where all the new age people are, it's, 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 <laughs> it's all Jungian books. And he resonates with people who are interested in the counterculture and new age things and sort of escaping from the horrors of the modern world. Mm -hmm. I see that makes sense. I don't know much about Jung, but all of that kind of <laughs> made sense with some contemporary people who I are grew up popular with that. Yeah, I grew up in families very much like the Santa Cruz one. So <laughs> I'm just surrounded by that type of, <laughs> of non. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> And if so anybody, think, yeah. oh, sorry, I was just going to also say if um, Joel has a really great website. So if anybody wants to go find, of course, he has a link to his book there, Freud Int Intellectual Biography, but there's much more of his work. So if anybody just types in Joel White book in Google, it's the first thing that pops up. Thanks for the plug. Uh, no problem. Thank <laughs> you. And Sam, I see you have one other question here, which before we get to Sopranos, which I don't oh, know yeah. what it's about, but it sounds very interesting. So. <laughs> well, it's something I liked in your writing, which you wrote about physics envy, which a lot of social science sciences may suffer from. Am I correct? Physics envy? Am I saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was, uh, that's a term <laughs> from Richard Rorty. Oh, all right. So I, yeah. if you, I thought maybe you could explain that. I thought it was a really interesting way of putting it, like the differences between them. Well, when I was a philosophy student in the 60s and the 70s, uh, you know, we were living in a very, uh, American philosophy departments were very positivistic. Ironically, it was the result of the Viennese members of the uh, Vienna, Vienna Circle who had come here and it become so important in American universities. But there was a fetishization and an idealization of science where mm -hmm. mathematical physics was taken to be the paradigm, the only model of valid, uh, of valid um, knowledge. And all other forms of science, social, uh, sociology, psychology, economics, were all considered immature, that was the word, mm -hmm. to the extent that they didn't fulfill the, uh, the rigors of mathematical physics. Uh, there was a program here which was initiated by members of the Vienna Circle, called the Program for Unified Science. And they put out the Minnesota Studies and the Philosophy of Science. And their, the line they were pushing uh, was that all other immature sciences had to be reduced down to physics and chemistry. So that was the reigning model, which really got disrupted when Uh, Thomas Kuhn published The Structure of Scientific Revolutions and the shit hit the fan. <laughs> and after that, there were, uh, you know, developments multiplied in, in, in very many directions. But one of the propitious developments, you might say, which um, Rorty, who had a very good sense of humor, uh, described with the terms physics envy, Uh, was that uh, philosophers of science, especially philosophers of social science, no longer had physics in me, no longer had to take physics as the model that they have to, had to justify themselves in terms of. And of, of course, Rorty was playing on the idea of uh, penis envy in <laughs> psychoanalysis, uh, which, the, uh, which the feminists had, had criticized. So, yeah, it's so good that we, we got, got rid of our physics envy, it emancipated us just like when the feminists got rid of their, well, the so-called <laughs> feminists, it emancipated them. Okay, yes, it's good that we've moved on from that. Okay, this is great. Thank you again for being so generous with your time. So as I mentioned, just your website a minute ago, the, the last paragraph um, of your introduction biography says that you're a member of Slate's discussion group on the Sopranos which was one of your proudest credentials. I thought I was going to say proudest moments, but it says credentials. One so, of my finest moments. Finest <laughs> moments. <laughs> so what can you tell us? I mean, I'm guessing there is so much more to beyond, of course, you know, the whole Tony goes and sees a psychiatrist and all this, but I'm guessing there are many, many more layers in the show that can be, that can be dissected and talked about. Well, I mean, The Sopranos was this enormous hit here. Mm 
And in the second year, everybody was writing about it. Mm -hmm. And Slate.com, which had just started at the time, as one of the first online magazines, was looking for a different angle. And uh, they had these different discussion groups. Like they'd have four nuclear physicists talking about disarmament, or I don't know, four experts on the Middle East talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And uh, so they decided their, their angle would be to have four analysts discuss Tony's relationship with his uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mel. Uh, so me and three of my colleagues for two years, every week had an online discussion about what had happened in the show that night. So the show would air here at nine o'clock on Sunday night. Mm -hmm. As soon as it was over, I would rush to my computer and write up my, <laughs> my thing. It was kind of like a, uh, a, a opera critic or a, mm -hmm. somebody going to a boxing match or an opera and having to post a review right after. A report. <laughs> and I would get done about one o'clock in the morning and post it. And then I send it in. And the next day, uh, there would be, it would be posted at noon. And for a day, there would be an online discussion between me and my colleagues. And then beyond that, it would open up and you know, people from the outside could post their comments. It was the most popular thing there ever was on Slate. They got oh, wow. more, more hits and more. It was <laughs> it was one of the most interesting, most fun things I ever did. Uh, you know, as I said to you before we started recording, uh, in my opinion, uh, The Sopranos is one of the great achievements of American popular culture. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, it, it's not accidental that it's also a mafia film or series, and I would put it up there with The Godfather. And one of the things that was so great about it, uh, you know, when you write about something, you have to really study it very carefully. And as I studied it, I saw how it worked on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was the family drama, there was the sitcom, there was the postmodern irony, there was the mafia story. There was a psychoanalytic dimension. There was sort of the critique of suburbia. And all these things uh, were integrated, and it, it was a sense of humor, it was funny as hell, mm -hmm. were integrated into this, uh, uh, into this fantastic creation. And another thing I liked about it uh, was it really took a very specific American vernacular. I mean, just like James Joyce took the vernacular of Dublin, uh, David Chase, the, the creator of it, took the vernacular of New Jersey and turned it into this uh, great work of art. Uh, so, I, I, and, and uh, the, the uh, group of actors they had, especially uh, James Gandolfini, mm -hmm. were just superb. Uh, and, you know, uh, during COVID, uh, apparently, you know, we've all been stuck indoors and streaming all sorts of stuff. Apparently, younger people are rediscovering or have rediscovered <laughs> a very popular game. And I read one account of it, uh, one of the, uh, besides all the things I mentioned, uh, which explain why it resonated with the young generation. Also, it came out right at the time of uh, uh, the, the uh, year I started writing about it uh, was in 2001. Mm -hmm. So it came out right after 9-11 and then it came out during the war in Iraq. So it was during another very, how shall I say, problematic political period here. And uh, this article was saying one of the reasons young people were draw, uh, attracted by it, uh, despite all its intrinsic greatness, was that I met David Chase, the producer. Mm. He's a very tough-minded uh, New Jersey, half Italian guy with absolutely no illusions. And uh, it portrayed the emptiness and the uh, corruptness of American society already back then. And you know, now after the Trump years and everything that's happened, uh, younger people uh, can relate to it. 
Yes, I mean, I discovered it myself around uh, probably six years ago. But yes, it seems, I mean, there's just so many social messages and, you know, discussions that it can just perhaps be relevant at all times. And you mentioned 9-11 and they they bring that in very well and very nicely in the last season or two where they're, you know, so it's kind of ironic. There are these mafia members, but they're so concerned with terrorism <laughs> and terrorist right. activity going down and they they just believe anything and you also mentioned some of the actors i mean it's so true i mean the person when the characters of ralph and richie in the f- season two and three are perhaps my favorite but well, yes that's tony's mother yes well <laughs> tony's mother of course her too but I mean, it's just <laughs> junior it's fascinating exactly it's junior, yeah. how much of a kind of Tony uses him throughout the whole season, throughout the whole show. And, and you know, if you look at it, if you if you if you look at it, uh, compared to the um, um, the Godfather, mm-hmm. it's part of the American story. The Godfather was about the Americanization of one Italian family, how they came here, how uh, Don Corleone Senior uh, still brought all the old world uh, uh, traditions with him mafia traditions. Uh, And then he wanted his son, Michael, to become Americanized, Mm -hmm. become a senator. And uh, uh, Vito doesn't want him to have anything to do with this stuff. But Michael gets drawn in. And you go through the next step in Americanization. And he takes the family from New York and out to Las Vegas and so on and so forth. But then with the Sopranos, you get the suburbanization of mm-hmm. one Italian family. And it's the move from New York and Long Island to suburban New Jersey. And Tony, I mean, what, what you might say Tony is having identity crisis because the, the landmarks of the old tradition oh, yes. <laughs> are breaking down, which we're all, we're all experiencing. And that's one of the reasons for his panic attacks. Mm-hmm. Don Corleone had no uh, panic attacks. <laughs> he had no difficulty. <laughs> he knew who he was, what his role was, and so on. Tony doesn't know how to be a Don. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you have these funny things that there's this mafioso Don, you know, who's on a treadmill, and his wife is nagging him about flossing. <laughs> so, you know, it goes from, so no, that's so true. I mean, I'm not too, I've seen The Godfather perhaps um, once, but exactly. I mean, it kind of reminds me what you just said about Tony. I mean, Tony's always talking about, I forgot about this person's name, but he keeps on saying what happened to the X type, you know, the tough person who like holds it all in and doesn't go out and talk about Gary he brings Cooper. Gary Cooper. Gary Cooper, <laughs> he Gary brings Cooper. Them up. Yeah, which, is, which is also funny because Gary Cooper is this totally, you know, idealized American hero. There's it's so much story. part of the American male myth that's been criticized now. I mean, Tony buys into it. Yes. And sorry, and this is the he, last comment. Sorry, go ahead, Sam, and then I'll mention my last comment. No, no, no go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to ask you a question, but go ahead. Yeah, I know. I was just going to mention when you talked about, you know, becoming American, there's just this, uh, there's this episode in season two where Polly uh, goes with Tony to Italy and he was so excited to go there and discover his roots. But I mean, when he goes there, they don't even eat the pasta the way he does it. And then when he comes back, it's funny, they're showing in a car scene and he's just in New Jersey looking at the most bland like tunnel or something. And he has just a big grin on his face because, well, in fact, he's back back home where he belongs and feels comfortable. I, I don't know if you guys have been to New York. But the yes. drive where he goes through the tunnel to where he lives in New Jersey goes through some of the ugliest, most mm-hmm. less realized parts of America. <laughs> Makes and then sense. It emerges in this, in this suburban utopia. Yes. Yes, that's very true. Yeah. Okay, Sam, go ahead because, yeah. No, I was wondering if you had, to, uh, well, because you mentioned Godfather and Sopranos and Mafia. By the way, you say you haven't seen it recently? It's the 50th anniversary of The Godfather. And I'll yeah, recommend it. It was a couple. It was in the Academy of days ago. Yeah. But uh-huh. if you haven't seen it lately, I, I would recommend give a look. No, Take I should look. definitely watch it properly. <laughs> Sorry. Fantastic. Uh, no, just because you mentioned mafia movies and stuff. I was wondering, did you did you have an opinion on Scorsese films like Goodfellows and Casino and all that? Would you put them up there with Sopranos? And did you ever watch Boardwalk Empire, which came out 
about the same time as Sopranos, and it was very years later, I think. Ah, yeah. All right. Well, Scorsese. I mean, when when uh, Mean Streets came out, uh, I was Mm. a graduate student at the time, living in downtown New York. Uh, I mean, it was like a breakthrough. It was like this great thing. This a completely new style of uh, cinema, and uh, you know, was so familiar. Uh, you know, I, I don't think Scorsese's. I mean, the one the one that uh, always gets compared to The Godfather is Goodfellas. It's okay, but I don't think it's up there with. It. And I think this last one, the the Irishman. Uh, which uh, was supposed to be his masterpiece. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have a uh, sort of dissenting opinion here, but uh, most people loved it. I thought it was very tedious. I thought it was humorless. I thought he went over, you know, the same old stuff that he'd been doing for years, and I wasn't impressed with it. The film I am, I do love with him, which really is a uh, culture critique of America, is The Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> that's that's fantastic film. Uh, yes certainly maybe okay. because it has leo maybe that's why it takes it the no. next level i don't think the irish uh the irish man has leonardo or does it no 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 okay. no no i wouldn't have it otherwise you know. <laughs> He's fantastic. king of comedy is good yeah that's good, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> but i don't think he I don't, I don't think he ever reached the niveau as they say of the godfather or the soprano Godfather, in my view, is I, I, I think I love Godfather more than Sopranos even, but yeah, I, mean, I get it. <laughs> well, I understand. Godfather is more, is more epical. I mean, in a way, Sopranos, because it meant to be a TV mm-hmm. sitcom, it doesn't have the, uh, I don't know, grandeur. Typical grandeur of Godfather. Even, uh, yeah. I, I was living in Vermont when The Godfather came out, and I stood in the snow in a blizzard the shopping center <laughs> going to Vermont for an hour to see it. And as soon as opens, you know, it was, uh, somebody explained to me, he used a different kind of film stock when he shot it. And it has a whole video. You know, the opening scenes with Vito in his uh, study, you know, having these uh, uh, sessions with people. I mean, it just had a different presence to it from the, from the outset. Established yeah, itself. <laughs> And when you yeah the sh- scenes in Italy you feel the oranges and it's when he go in the second one when when he's Danny walking Ray's up the mountain uh, in Corleone he's, he's, yeah. your father in law so good <laughs> <laughs> okay brilliant well as I mentioned a, a few times Joel has a very great and easy accessible website for anybody who wants to go learn more about his work thank you again so much for being so generous with your time Professor Joel and for putting up with our half half big questions on Freud and, <laughs> and other that. subjects. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And will you send me a copy of this? Yes, oh. certainly. As soon as we put it up, which should be in a few weeks though, however, not, not in the take, coming week or two. Okay, take care. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and we'll see you in our next video. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.